The following program, Search the Scriptures, is brought to you by the Highway 5 South Church of Christ in Mountain Home. Speakers are Keith Sharp and Trevor Campbell. We invite you to call or write the church to submit questions for the speakers to answer. We'll provide answers from the Bible to your questions. Trevor, do you sprinkle or pour or, or how do you baptize? Oh, immersion. Immersion. Yeah. Well, let's talk Completely about covered. that this evening. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good evening. I'm Keith Sharp. I preach at the Highway 5 South Church of Christ. You're watching Search the Scriptures. My partner is Trevor Campbell. Trevor, please introduce yourself and the brethren in Piet. Yeah, sure. My name is Trevor Campbell. I do preach over in Piet, worship with the group that meets there on Highway 62 on the north side of the highway next to Dollar General. We're pretty easy to find. If you would like to join us, we meet on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. for a Bible class, and that's, a, that's an open discussion of God's Word. So you can come and ask questions and make comments and so forth. Um, and then we have worship service at 10.45 a.m. There's a number on the screen. That's my number. Call me there if you have a question for the program for Keith and I to discuss, or if you have any questions about the church in Payette. The number is 870-435-2737. And thank you, Trevor. You folks over in Marion County, be sure and drop by and visit with the folks there. And if you have a question, let Trevor know what your question is. We depend upon uh, your questions to generate the subject matter on this program. So please let us know what your questions are, and we'll be glad to give you a Bible answer to any question that pertains to our soul salvation. Of course, as I've already said, I'm Keith Sharp. I preach at the Highway 5 South Church of Christ in Mountain Home. Uh, we meet one mile south of the Highway 62-412 bypass. To get there, you turn south or southwest, southeast, excuse me, off uh, of the Highway 62-412 bypass going towards Salesville. And you'll pass Good Samaritan and then look on the left and there's the sign for the Highway 5 South Church of Christ. We have our worship assemblies uh, at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, but we have Bible classes for all ages at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning, and we have another worship assembly at 2 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. We have Wednesday evening Bible study and assembly at 7 o'clock. You're invited to all of those. And then, of course, we have a ladies' Bible class at 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning, and you ladies would be much benefited by coming and attending that ladies' Bible class. So come out to our services. If you have a question for me, and I uh, not only encourage you, but I, I implore you to let us know what your questions are uh, so we can give you Bible answers for those questions. We won't tell you what our opinion is. We won't tell you what a church creed says. We'll tell you what the Bible says. If you have a question, then please call me, Keith Sharp, at 870 three two one five seven four six. You can email me at Keith Sharp twenty twenty one at gmail dot com or if you prefer you can write to post office box two six three in Mountain Home seven two six five four. Let us know what your questions are. Well Trevor, here's the question we have this evening. Can you please tell me where it says that you're supposed to be fully immersed when baptized? Well Trevor, what about that? <laughs> Fully immersed, huh? Well, in Ephesians chapter 4, and beginning in verse 4, Paul is going to mention a body. He's talking about the body of Jesus Christ, which in the context of the book, uh, he brings out very clearly is the church. It's the Lord's church. He says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Now, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, and he is an inspired writer, uh, a man who had the gift of the Holy Spirit and the ability to, to uh, reveal God's word. He was a prophet of God. And so these are the words of God. And, and what he says here, I think, is of the utmost importance. You know, he, he says there's one Lord. I think most people that are religious and have a belief in God would accept that. Yes, there's one Lord, one God, one Father, accept all these things. But right there it says in verse 5, there's one baptism. Now this, these are the words of God, God speaking. He says there's one baptism that I recognize. And so I mean, it's, it's our duty, my duty, all of us, to find out, well, what is that baptism? You know, what, what does it mean to be, to be part of that one baptism, to partake of that? And first of all, 
I would like to talk just a little bit about the meaning of some of these words. Like, for instance, the word baptism, which in the Greek, baptisma, is the transliterated word, so very, very close there to the supposed English <laughs> word there, uh, baptism. Uh, one baptism, baptisma. Well, the word means to immerse or, or to, to dip down, to go under. And uh, the word bapto in, in the Greek language, which is you know, where that word came from, essentially, uh, means to dip. All right, so no, no uh, idea of sprinkling there uh, in this text. Other texts, like in Acts 2 and 38, when the Apostle Peter commanded the people on the day of Pentecost to be baptized, that word baptizo there, again, is a word that's related to baptisma. And again, we're talking about immersion or going down under. In this case, very clearly, we're talking about immersion in water, to be dipped in water. Now, I know there are folks that, uh, that teach that sprinkling is an acceptable form of baptism. But it's interesting to me that never in any of the texts that deal with baptism does sprinkling ever come up. It's never mentioned, it's never brought up, yet the word sprinkling does appear in the New Testament. In fact, it appears a lot in the book of Hebrews. And, and beginning in Hebrews chapter 9, the word sprinkling is going to start appearing. Uh, this word, though, <coughs> excuse me, this word in the context deals with blood. And eventually what the Hebrew writer, because the, the book of Hebrews deals so much with the Old Testament and references it so much, it's going to deal with first the, the blood of the animals under, those, under that Old Covenant law. But what he's going to talk about and, and bring us to is the New Covenant and the blood of Jesus Christ, which those who have been baptized, immersed in the name of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ is, in essence, spiritually sprinkled upon them. His blood makes atonement for our sins. Take a look here in Hebrews chapter 9, and beginning in verse 11, where he says, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, there's the word sprinkling, so it is used by the New Testament writers, sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. There is the word sprinkling. The word sprinkling there in the Greek language, rantizo, you don't have to remember any of this, it's not really important, but it is important to understand that it is different from the word baptisma or uh, baptizo, where we're talking there in those references to immersion or submersion. So actually going down into the waters. Here, this word sprinkling, it is appropriately used because in the Old Covenant, blood was sprinkled. They didn't get dunked in blood, but the high priest and, and, and the priest and the altar, everything was sprinkled with, with blood as part of that Old Covenant. Take a look further in the text. Down to verse 19. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people, according to the, according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet, wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. There's the word again, sprinkled. Saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise, he sprinkled, there's the word again, with blood, both their tabernacle and all their vessels of ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So that's very important. According to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. We need the blood of Jesus Christ. Because as the writer points out a little bit later in chapter 10, the blood of these animals could never take away sin. We needed the sprinkling of the blood of Christ. But that has nothing to do with baptism. Verse 23, Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens, heavenly things, should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. The better sacrifice was Jesus Christ. The better blood sacrifice was Christ and his sprinkling of blood. Now that takes place when one is baptized, but one is not sprinkled because baptism is never described in that fashion. And that word, and it's used also by the Apostle Peter, this word sprinkling or to sprinkle, it is never used in conjunction with baptism. Baptism always is, is used using the Greek language of submersion or, uh, or immersion, being dipped, going down into the water. But when we do so, yes, the, the sprinkling of the blood of Christ 
takes place. So the New Testament writers were not unfamiliar with the word sprinkling, but they never, ever used it concerning baptism. All right, Keith, I'll kick it over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Trevor. I want to give just a few simple passages that I believe will establish uh, that baptism is immersion or burial. It's going under the water and coming up out of the water. Uh, and it, there's, a, there's a specific reason uh, that God chose that as baptism. Uh, I want to give, first of all, an example that to me is pretty striking. This is Philip as he's preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, and the Spirit of the Lord, uh, he actually called by an angel of the Lord to go and, and, and to preach he went to the, the road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is desert. And, and he, going along there, there was a, a man riding along in a chariot. He was the uh, treasurer of the nation of Ethiopia, treasurer of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Uh, and so he was an important man. He was riding in a chariot. He was reading Isaiah chapter 53, and, and the Spirit of the Lord told Philip, go near and join to the chariot. And so he ran to the chariot and said, Do you understand what you're reading? He was reading from Isaiah chapter 53, the prophecy concerning uh, the Messiah to be crucified. And, and the, the uh, eunuch uh, answered, How can I unless someone should guide me? And he asked Philip to come up and ride with him. And so it shows where he was reading. And now I want to pick up uh, in, in verse 32. Uh, oh, excuse me, skip on down to verse 34. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, now he's, he's reading from Isaiah chapter 53, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or some other man? Dear, and then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see here is water, what hinders me from being baptized? Now before I read on, I want to tell you something that actually happened. Now, you may think that I'm just making this up, but this actually did happen in a discussion that I had with some people. Uh, I introduced Acts chapter 8 as an example of this is immersion. And the argument was made that uh, the eunuch had some water in a jar in the chariot uh, and that going in a desert place, a deserted place is what that means by the way. There was not enough water for immersion and so he just sprinkled him with, with some, some water that he had in a jar. Well alright, you know if that's the meaning of that word water in, in Acts chapter 8, water in a jar, then you can substitute that phrase water in a jar where it says water and it won't alter the meaning of it. So let's do that. Uh, as they went down the road they came to some water in a jar. And the eunuch said, See, here's water in a jar. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Verse 38. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water in the jar, and he baptized him. Now, I just say that's a humongous water, or a humongous jar. <laughs> But you understand that's just nonsense. No, there's not any water in a jar. They came to some water. And they both went down into the water. And if baptism is not immersion, if it's not a beer, why do they both go down to the water? Why He may have had some water in a jar in that chair, but that's not what they got into. They went down into the water. While they were in the water, he baptized them. Then they came up out of the water. They were in the water. Both of them were. Why did they do that if baptism is not immersion? And so I believe that's just an illustration from Acts chapter 8 that baptism is indeed immersion. He went down into the water. I want to introduce one other passage, and then I'll turn it back over to Trevor. In Romans chapter 6, and this is one of two passages where this particular term is used concerning baptism. In Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, the Apostle Paul says, Or do you not know? that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. Therefore, now notice carefully, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Baptism is a likeness of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's to demonstrate that we're placing our trust not in water, 
but we're placing our trust in what Jesus did for us on the cross. We're placing our trust in the fact that Jesus died on the cross, was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, and was raised again from the dead on the third day. And that in the likeness of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we die to the love and practice of sin when we repent. We're buried in the waters of baptism, and we're raised to walk in a new life. The Apostle Paul, and this is not the only place he calls it that, the Apostle Paul specifically calls baptism a burial. Now I had one man argue with me this way about baptism being a burial. He said, well, uh, American Indians would bury people by placing them on a platform above the ground. So maybe that could uh, uh, symbolize a burial, just placing them on a platform above the ground. Well, I'm not baptized, and I don't baptize people uh, in, in memorial or in symbol, in, 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 as a symbol of the burial of American Indians. I baptize people as a symbol of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Was Jesus placed on a platform, his dead body, after he was crucified? In Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, Jesus said, as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Jesus was placed in the heart of the earth. He was placed underground in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And on the third day He was raised from that tomb and we're baptized in memorial of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus was put under the ground. We're put under the water. Baptism is a burial. It's immersion. All right, Trevor, I'm going to stop there and turn it back over to you. Where, where did you leave off in chapter 6 there? Was that verse I just five? read verses 3 and 4. 3 and 4, yeah, that's what yeah. I thought. Okay, if it's all right with you, I'd like to continue oh, on there. By all means. All right. You know, that's, a, that's an excellent text you brought up. And verse 5, let's continue to read a little bit and talk about it a little more. So going along with what Keith has just said, and I agree with everything he just said, um, I think that's absolutely scriptural according to Bible. Verse 5, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, that's Christ's death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So there's a tie there. Baptism, as Keith has already shown us, being, being immersed, going down into the water, a likeness of the burial of Jesus Christ. Well, we come up and we rise up as Christ did. We rise up to newness of life, as Keith has already shown us. But there in verse 5, if we have also been buried in the likeness of his death, then we will also be in the likeness of his resurrection. And so I believe what's being taught here is if we want to be partakers of the resurrection of life, then we must also be buried and united together with Christ in baptism. And that'd be according to, the again, the one baptism. Going back to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5 there, there's only one baptism that God recognizes that God has instructed us concerning. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. So that being dead with Christ, dying with Christ, again, is a reference to that baptism, that burial. So if I'm going to live with Jesus Christ, then I have to be buried in baptism. Verse, uh, verse 9, Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. The death that he died, he died to sin once for all, the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. When we're baptized, our sins are forgiven. That's what Peter on the day of Pentecost commanded the people to do. He said, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, Acts 2.38, for the remission or for the forgiveness of your sins. So that your sins are forgiven, your sins are cleansed. When you come up, you walk in newness of life. You've put away, you've put to death the old man, the old sinful man, and now you walk with Jesus Christ. Well, I want to look at another text, Keith. I want to, uh, I want to talk just for a moment a little bit about a, a figure of baptism, if you will, in the Old Testament. Um, when you go back to the Old Testament, you look in Exodus chapter 30. I'm not going to go to it, but you can read about the details of this on your own time. But in Exodus chapter 30 is where God gives instructions for Aaron and his sons to serve as priests. And part of the instructions in Exodus 30 was they were to wash, Moses was to make this, this wash basin, this rather large basin 
for them to wash in before they could go and serve in the tabernacle. Now, there were other things that were done as well. Blood was sprinkled upon them. There was, there was garments they had to wear. There were a lot of things to prepare them uh, to go and serve in the tabernacle. And that tabernacle, according to Exodus chapter 25, was God's dwelling place. God said, let them make me a sanctuary, a tabernacle, that I may dwell among them. Well, later on, the tabernacle was done away with in, in the days of Solomon, not by man's ideas, but because God commanded it. God commanded Solomon to build him a house and to build a temple for him. And so Solomon built this temple, and that became God's dwelling place. In the New Testament, the temple of God is no more, no physical temple, but rather the New Testament speaks of God's people as being his temple, being a, a spiritual house that God dwells among and walks among. And you can read about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, that God's people are his temple. And so it started with the tabernacle, transferred to the physical temple, and now in the new covenant age, God's people are the temple. But going back to Exodus 30, before those priests could enter that temple, there were things they had to do before they could enter that tabernacle. Well, in 1 Peter chapter 2, I believe for us, baptism is necessary for us to be members of the temple of God, to, to serve in that tabernacle, if you will. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter says in verse 4, he says, coming to him, that's Jesus Christ, as to a living stone. Jesus Christ is a living stone, very important. He's a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones. Now, who's Peter talking to? He's talking to God's people here. And he calls them living stones. Christ is a living stone. They are living stones. He says, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house. This is the house of God. A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. So Peter here talks about this spiritual house, and this house is made up of living stones, which are the Christians, the members of the church, and they're built upon the cornerstone, the living stone, Jesus Christ. So, you know, how do we become one of these living stones? How do we make up this spiritual house? Well, take a look in the book of Colossians for a moment, in chapter 2. In Colossians chapter 2, in verse 12, goes along with the text Keith took us to in Romans 6. Buried, buried with him, that's Jesus Christ, Colossians 2, 12. Buried with Christ in baptism, in which you also were, ra excuse me, also were raised with him through faith, in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now let's pause there and back up just a moment to what we read there uh, in 1 Peter. Peter said that Jesus Christ is a living stone, and he called the members of the church living stones, built upon that chief cornerstone of Christ, and they make up this spiritual house of God. Well, here in the text, what does he say? But to be made alive with Christ, Christ is a living stone. He's alive, and he's made us alive with him. How? Well, verse 12, by being buried with him in baptism. So it's not possible, possible to be alive with Jesus Christ and be one of these living stones and be part of the house of God, ready to serve in God's house, unless I've first been baptized with him, buried with him, excuse me, baptized into Christ, buried with him in baptism. So Ephesians 4, going back to the, I think that was the first text I, I went to, God said, God said there's one baptism, one baptism. And when we look through the scriptures, we find that baptism, in order to, to, to be part of that baptism, we have to have faith in Jesus Christ, believe that he is the Son of God. We have to be baptized for the reason that we're having our sins forgiven, and we're buried with him in baptism, and then we rise up alive with him, and if we continue to walk with him, then we will also be a part of that resurrection of life that comes in the, the last judgment day. All right, Keith, I'll kick it back over to you. All right, thanks, Trevor. Uh, so there's two passages then we've looked at that indicate that baptism is a burial. Uh, read those for yourself, please. In Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, and Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Both of them specifically say baptism is a burial. And that should tell us that baptism is immersion. That's the reason we immerse rather than sprinkle or pour and call it baptism. As Trevor pointed out at the beginning of the program, sprinkling and pouring don't uh, 
meet the definition of the word anyway. Uh, any more than I could uh, run by walking or, or, or fly by running. That, those are different actions. Sprinkling and pouring are different action than, than burial. So you can't bury somebody by sprinkling or pouring. It. You have to put them under the water to bury them. It's immersion. I want to look at one other passage uh, in, in the time we have remaining. Uh, I'm going to go to Hebrews chapter 10 and begin in verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, in having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled. I'll notice, sprinkling does have something to do with it. Our hearts are sprinkled. What with? having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. When our bodies, and by the way, the word or the phrase pure water doesn't mean we have to uh, put it, run it through a, a purifier and make sure that there's no filth in the water. It means just water in contrast with the water of the sprinkling and washing of the Old Testament, which included the scarlet wool hyssop, and the ashes of a red heifer. We don't have to mix all that stuff in with it. We just use water. So it's just water. It's not all the things mixed under the Old Testament. When our bodies are washed in water, then our hearts, the inner man, the conscience, are sprinkled with the blood of Christ and cleansed by the blood of Christ. Sometimes people say, oh, you believe in water baptism. We believe in and." and our water salvation, we believe in salvation by the blood of Christ. I believe in salvation by the blood of Christ, but the blood of Christ has to be uh, accessed by baptism in water. When our bodies are washed in pure water, our hearts, our conscience, the inner person, is cleansed by the blood of Christ of the guilt of sin. It's not water uh, or blood. It's the blood through the water. You get into the water in order to access the blood. And so over and over again, uh, whether you go to the original Greek and look at the meaning of the word there where it's clear that it's talking about immersion, or whether you simply look at passages in the English that all can uh, read and, and, and understand without understanding any Greek, uh, such as why did uh, Philip and the unit go down and into the water? Uh, and why did they both come up out of the water? Why did Paul call it a burial in Romans chapter 6? Why did he call it a burial in Colossians chapter 2? Why did he say having our bodies washed with pure water and our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience in Hebrews chapter 10? All of these and more indicate that baptism is a burial. Trevor, do you have anything you'd like to add before we draw the program to a close? No, I thought that was all excellent. Uh, I, I would extend the invitation to, to anyone who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and wants forgiveness of their sins to be baptized. I don't have to do it. Keith doesn't have to do it. If you want us to, we will. <laughs> Absolutely, right, Keith? No, oh, amen. But uh, it doesn't have to be us. Be baptized. If you believe in Jesus Christ and believe He's the Son of God and want forgiveness of your sins, go and have somebody, somebody baptize you. And then join a, a local group, group of people that worships God according to the Scriptures and, and follows the doctrine of Jesus Christ and baptizes with immersion. Follow, be with a group like that. So there you go. There's the invitation. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. Thank you for watching Search the Scriptures. If you have a Bible question or comment, you may call 870-321-5746, email keithsharp at suddenlink.net, or write Keith Sharp at P.O. Box 263, Mountain Home, Arkansas, 72654. And your question will be answered on the air. Be sure to watch next week at the same time for another edition of Search the Scriptures. Until then, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace.